it's, it's great to be it's great to be back thank you <laughs> it's uh, it's good to be able to uh, to minister again and um, just sh- open God's word and just share thank you for all your prayers over the past few months we're still in the middle of the fire but God is faithful amen and um, we're going to be looking at uh, something this evening. And over the next, as Steve mentioned, the Bible study, we had uh, we had our first Bible study uh, in the series that I'm going to be doing um, on the hallmarks of a disciple. We had our first one a couple of weeks ago, or last week, I think it was. And so we're going to be uh, going into the uh, into what is a disciple. We looked last time at what was a disciple. Um, and we're going to be looking at the hallmarks of a disciple. So if you want to know what, about how you can be a disciple of Jesus Christ, then uh, then come along. We're going to be looking at the Beatitudes because uh, I believe that that is a template uh, for us as disciples of Jesus, how we are to be and how we are to be to others. So uh, we'll be looking at those. But we're going to be um, looking at something else this evening Uh for my own personal devotions, uh, I'm reading Psalms again. And uh, Psalms is, a, is an interesting book. It's a, song, it's a book of songs, as you know. And uh, sometimes you can read through quite a few, can't you? And, uh, and sometimes you'll read through one and then you'll think about it for a while. And sometimes you'll just read a couple of verses. And you'll just meditate on that um, as the Lord speaks to you. And as uh, as I was preparing uh, for this uh, this meeting tonight, um, I uh, in, in, I came across uh, to the point where I was reading Psalm 40. And so, uh, if you've got your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to Psalm 40. We're going to read a few verses from that chapter. <coughs> And I just feel that tonight, these these few thoughts that I feel that the Holy Spirit has just dropped into my heart are quite critical for some people and are relevant in quite an amazing way. A way that I, even until I walked into the meeting tonight, didn't even realise. Um, but uh, let's just pray. Abba, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you hear our cry. We thank you, Lord, that you hear our hearts. Lord, when we haven't got words left to say, you still hear us. And uh, Lord, I just pray, Lord, for your word tonight. I pray, Lord, for these few simple thoughts. Lord, I pray that you'll take take away anything of me. The Lord, that we'll just hear your Holy Spirit speak to us. And that you will just be glorified. That the name of Jesus will be glorified in people's lives tonight. For your glory we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let me just read the first um, four verses from Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, And he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust and has not turned to the proud, nor to those who lapse into falsehood. Walking with the Lord through life's experiences and situations is, I'm sure that those that know the Lord and those that are committed to him as as, as Christians, we would agree that it's a wonderful thing. Just walking with Jesus day by day is a wonderful thing. To know his hand is within our lives, it gives us great encouragement and it gives us great comfort as well. Because he is the one who leads us, and he is the one who guides us, amen? He is the one who prepares us 
for our eternal heavenly future. But we always need to remember that this fellowship with God came at a great cost. And he wants us to know the reality of that. He wants us to know the reality of the cost that he went through so that we could have fellowship with him. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, For you were bought with a great price. You were bought with a great price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And in Ephesians 1, we see the reason for that price and why that price is so very precious. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. It came at a great cost. Our salvation, our relationship with God came at a great cost. But it was all for a reason. It was so that you could have fellowship with God. It was so that you could walk with God. It's so that you could wake up every day knowing that God is in control of your life, that you have a purpose, that there is a plan in everything that comes your way. So I would ask you the question, are you glad tonight that you belong to him? It's not a rhetorical question. You can talk to me, all right? Well, you know, I like people talking to me. So are you glad tonight that Jesus has saved you? Amen? We need to be. We need to be glad that Jesus has saved us, that Jesus has redeemed us. It's the greatest thing that eternity has to offer you. Nothing else beats it. That you are being made ready for the Lord's return when we will be with him forever. We've heard a lot, haven't we, in our church over the last month about Jesus returning. And it's happening You've only got to see the things that are going on around us. You've only got to read the newspapers and watch the TV. The signs are coming together as Jesus said they would, as the prophets said they would. Jesus is at the very door. We need to be ready. Because we have a, a hope. Amen? Well, I want to ask you a question, and I'll ask you this at the very beginning. Do you have that hope? Do you have that hope? Do you know that Jesus has restored you into a right relationship with God through his death on the cross and will raise you to new life just as he was resurrected? You see, you need to know tonight, before you leave tonight, that there's no doubt in your mind that you belong to Jesus. You need to know. You need to know that you, as a sinner, have repented from your sins you need to know that you have eternal life and have been born again of the Spirit of God. Because this is the reality of walking with Jesus. That assurance that's in our hearts that we know that he's with us every day. You know, when we look at this crazy world around us and we should do what Jesus told us to do in Luke 21. When you see these things begin to happen, look up and lift your heads, because your redemption draws near. And uh, as uh, Amir mentioned when he, was, when he was here, and he spoke on Colossians chapter 3, those wonderful verses, If then you were raised in Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Oh, those words wonderful. Your life is hidden 
in Christ with God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And Titus tells us in his letter, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. That's why Jesus died, to make you special. Amen? He died to save you. He died to restore you. He died to build a relationship back to God. And he, he was resurrected to prove that he did it. And now he's praying for you. Amen? If that doesn't put a smile on our face, folks, I know it's raining outside, but if that doesn't put a smile on our, on our faces, then I don't know what does. We have an eternal future. We have a heavenly citizenship. We are his. And God walks with us every step of the way. As we read through God's word, the Bible, we see that God walked with many people. We see his leading and guiding through life's troubles, difficulties and successes. And we see that when God took control and led the way, the person achieved greatness in God. You know, I, I read, as I read the Bible, um, I'm always very encouraged um, because God has a habit of choosing failures. And that gives me a great deal of comfort that God chooses failures because he chose me and he chose you. There's nothing about us that's worthy of his salvation. There's nothing about us that's worthy of his love. But he loves us anyway. And he chose us anyway. And God walked with ordinary people. And you know, when God walks with ordinary people, he gives them extraordinary lives. That's the promise. We see, don't we, as we go through the Bible, we see how God led the nation of Israel out of slavery into freedom and then into promise. He led them by an angel. Who was the angel? It was Jesus. The pillar of fire and the pillar of smoke. The angel of the Lord walked with them. They were never alone. Genesis tells us that God walked with Adam in the garden to have fellowship with him because he loved his creation. And uh, in chapter 5 we read of this very strange individual, Enoch. And we know nothing other about him, nothing else at all about him, other than he walked with God. He had fellowship with God. He walked alongside God. And because of that closeness, because of that relationship, God just took him. We just went. If you are that close to somebody, that relationship is, you know, so close. And that's the relationship that Enoch had. Abraham walked with God and his faith was counted to him for righteousness. God walked with Moses as he led the nation. He walked with Joshua as they entered the promised land. He walked with Elijah, Elisha, and all the other prophets as they called the nation back to God. He walked with the disciples as they proclaimed Jesus, firstly to their own people, the Jews, and then to the nations. And he walked with Paul as he travelled through the countries, what we call now Greece and Turkey, and then into Europe, pro proclaiming the gospel. God walked also, and most importantly, with his creation through Jesus, through our Messiah. He walked with him every day of his earthly ministry, revealing himself, God revealing himself, 
God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Revealing himself to a world out of control and full of sin. And you know, God has never gone away. He walks with his creation every single day because he loves his creation and he cares for his creation. He's here by his Holy Spirit and he's here tonight by his Holy Spirit. And he's here to convict you of sin. He's here to heal your heart. He's here to lift you out of a pit of despair because he loves you because he loves you God has never stopped walking with us through the good times and through the bad times by walking with us he sees the joy and he experiences the pain wasn't that Jesus through and through he saw the joy and he experienced the pain God is with his creation, but he's waiting for his creation to respond. Paul said in Acts 17, when he was talking to all the clever people, all the intellectuals at Athens, he said this to them, Therefore the one who you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made by hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gave, gives to all life, breath and all things. He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. God is never far from us. There's that old saying, isn't there? It's only a prayer away. And I think, actually, he's even closer than that. Because he wants to walk with us. God is not far from us, and he's certainly not far from you tonight. He's certainly not far from me. But you may feel that God is a million miles away. But let me tell you, you may feel that, but he is with you. And he's all around you. He's aware of your every need. He's aware of your every difficulty. And he proved this probably more in the life of one biblical figure than any other one. And it is the writer of this psalm, the shepherd king, David. Here we have a man who knew what it was to walk with God. He knew what it was to walk with God. But he was also a man who messed up time after time after time. But the thing was, he was a man like Abraham, who messed up time after time after time. He was a man who loved God. He loved him with all his heart. And you know, you know what the great thing was? God knew it. God knew what David was. He knew his heart, despite the times he messed up. You know, we can say lots of things and never mean it. We can make many false promises to God and we've all done it uh, and it's quite a dangerous thing to do because you know God takes you at your word. So if we're going to do that we need to make sure that we follow through. But despite even all that God knows our motives, he knows our hearts. With David, it was different though, because he meant what he said. He meant what he said 
when he wrote his psalms, when he said his words, when he said his prayers, when he wrote his music, he meant every single word of what he said. So we have a man here, warts and all. And there's no pretense from him. What you see is what you get. He didn't come in his Sunday best, looking the part. He didn't come putting on a front. He didn't put his church suit on or his church front on. You saw David for what he was. A man who loved God, but was a work in progress. And we can really learn a lot, I believe, from these words. These few verses at the beginning of Psalm 40. We can learn a lot about him. You don't have to be, and, I'm, and, and some, you know, I see my daughter and I see the, the um, environment and life that she, she lives. And I realise how difficult it is for the, today's generation. It doesn't take a young person long to realise that life is full of difficulties and full of problems and trials and it's full of pits, big pits. Even if you're not a believer, you're going to face difficulties in life. But when you belong to God, you become a target. The enemy doesn't like it. And we seem to be open more to life situations. And that's very much because by walking with God, we are more spiritually aware of what is going on. And we're spiritually aware of our place in this world and God's plan for our lives. And we need to remind ourselves that we need sometimes to live in the real world. Jesus said himself, didn't he, in 16, John 16, he said to his disciples, and that includes us, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. If Jesus has overcome the world through his sinless life, his death on the cross and resurrection, if we walk with him and we have accepted him as our saviour, we can too. We can overcome the world. Because as Ephesians 2 tells us, we have been made alive in Christ. We're no longer dead in our sins, but we are alive in Christ. But we will go through trials. James in his letter says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Who's... Who, 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 who of you has that one as their favourite verse? If I was to ask you what your favourite Bible verse was, I'm sure nobody would put, would put their hand up and say James 1, 2 to 4. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete. Lacking nothing. That is the reason that we may lack nothing, that we may have a relationship with God. You see, Jesus knew the pain and difficulty of trials. He knew what it was to be in the pit of despair. Remember when Jesus cried in the garden, he said, not my will, but your will be done. He knew what it was to be in the pit. He knew the agony of feeling that everyone had deserted him. But he knew that God was going to demonstrate something through him which had a greater purpose than what he was going through in his despair. God will always work a greater thing out of your despair. He will always work 
a greater testimony out of your difficulties. Because God has a purpose in our despair. Nothing happens in our lives where God doesn't have complete control. Our trials and our difficulties have one reason to bring us closer to Jesus. And that's in turn, as we become closer to him, helps us to reflect him to a world. It's the only way. You want to be strong for the Lord, you're going to go through difficulties. You want to be a witness for the Lord, you will never witness out of ignorance. But you will witness out of compassion, having gone through these things. Peter says in his letter, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and does not, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if needs be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honour and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you have not seen him, Yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the ultimate objective of being put through the trials, to be in the pit, the salvation of our souls, to become more like Jesus, to be ready when he appears so that we are like him, for we shall see him as he is. We have a great future, folks. You may not think it at the moment. You may be in that pit of despair. But look up, because your redemption is coming. God is answering your prayer. So how should we react? So let's look, look very quickly at some of David's words. Verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord. David was always in a fix, wasn't he? You know, he, if he wasn't trying to beat up giants, uh, he was having things thrown at him, people trying to kill him, people trying to, uh, to kick him off the throne, uh, his own son. I mean, you think you have problems. You know, he, he really went through it. He really went through the, the hard times. He was in the pit of despair so many times. But when we're in a pit, when everything looks lost and hopeless, waiting is our greatest test. Waiting is our greatest test. You see, we always want to work it out. I don't know if you like me, but... That's what I'm like, you know. I always want to work things out. Uh, and I always want to give God the answer. You know, this has happened, well, perhaps we could do this, God. And uh, guess what? It never works. It's just a recipe for disaster, really. Waiting is the biggest test. And in Matthew 6, in his discussions with his disciples, Jesus explains this his way. And he says that God has the answer before we even ask him. And if you think about it, he would do, wouldn't he? God wouldn't have the answer because he knows the beginning from the end. He knows you and he knows your plan 
He knows the purpose. So he knows when things go wrong, he's already put the answer in place. We just need to wait. We just need to be tested because we just need to become a little bit more like Jesus, have a few more hard edges knocked off us. You know, Isaiah 65, God tells us that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. Now, this might sound a bit of a strange sentence, and when I wrote it down, I thought it was a bit strange, but more thought about it, you may understand my logic. To learn how to wait is a result of already waiting. To learn how to wait is a result of already waiting. We never learn anything without going through experiences and without passing the tests. The result of waiting is that we can see God's sovereignty over our lives and we see it in a dynamic way. Jesus said, didn't he, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. And this becomes a reality. As we wait on the Lord, it becomes a reality. And he proves time after time after time that he is faithful and he is true. What he has said, he will do. And David tells us here, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me and heard my cry. As he waited and as he trusted God implicitly, without question, God inclined his ear. His ear. And this is an interesting picture because David is waiting for God. He's got all this chaos around him and he's waiting for God to answer him. And God literally bends over, bends down to listen to him. In the quietness and the chaos, God bends down and listens to David. And as David waited, God acted. And that is always the key. If we wait and listen to God's voice, God listens to us and acts. You see, God wanted to see what David would do. And when he saw faith in action, he acted. And this is a principle that we see throughout God's word, that God is with us, he was with the people in the scriptures, he is with us in our every situation. He just wants to see how we respond. He wants to see how we react. Are we going to try and work it all out for ourselves or are we going to learn to listen to him? Are we going to learn to wait for him? Are we going to learn to walk with him rather than to run ahead? Will we work it out and in the end just fudge the answer and mess it up? Or will we wait patiently and put our faith into action? You know, so often we say that we're in the palm of God's hand, don't we? So if that's the case, and that's the safest place to be, why are we so keen to jump back out of it again? Why are we so keen? Why are we so keen to sort things out ourselves? And by sorting it out ourselves, once we've jumped out to that hand, we are going further and further into this pit. Because our feet are not on the solid rock of his faithfulness. And so we really do need to learn to wait. And, it, and I'm not saying it's easy. It's the most difficult thing that we can do. It's a, it's a spiritual discipline that is so difficult to do. But with the power of the Holy Spirit within us, we are born again in the Spirit of God. We are filled with the Spirit of God. He enables us to trust. He enables us to work with him. We need to learn to wait. We need to live through our circumstances in the knowledge that we are safely in his grip, always under his watchful eye. And what is the outcome of acting in this way? Verse 4, blessed is that man who makes the Lord his trust.
if you want to see blessing in your life, wait and trust. When the difficulties of life come our way, wait and trust. Watch what God will do. He will never let you down. Verse 3, David goes and says, he has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. So let me ask you a question. When we face difficulties and trials, what song do we sing? What song do we sing? Is our song blessed assurance? Jesus is mine. Is it a new song that God gives us to overcome that difficulty? What was David's song? He was a master musician. He wrote songs all day long. So what was his song? He didn't write a song. God gave him the song. He didn't do it himself. Because he didn't fall into the trap. God gave him the song. He put a new song in my mouth. A song of praise to our God. If you want to sing a new song, ask him for it. And he'll give it you. Don't try and work the song out yourself. He will give you the song to take you through the difficulty. He will give you the song to lift you out of the pits of despair. You see, that song lasted David through the trials. It lasted him through his difficulties. And when he was on the other side of it, it became his song of testimony. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What a song. And God gave him that song. Amen. It was him who gave him the song. And as we read through Psalm 40, later in in verse 5, David just explains more and more about this song that God has given to him. Many, O O Lord my God, are your wonderful works which you have done. And your thoughts towards us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can can be numbered. I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I did not restrain my lips. O Lord, you yourself know, I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. And then he wraps it up in verse 16. Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let such as love your salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. This was the song that God gave to David. This is the song that God gives to us every day. He gives us a new song. When you wake up in the morning, ask God, what's the song for today? What do you want me to declare today? And David's song was, praise to our God. It's a great song, isn't it? Praise to our God. But it can be one of the most difficult songs to sing. But when we take our eyes off ourselves and our situations and onto a God who sees us, holding us firmly in his grip, who never leaves us or forsakes us, and who in his own way delivers us out of the pit. And then he sets us, our feet on firm ground, his faithfulness. Psalm 20, he also brought me out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my steps. So that's... Verse 2 of Psalm 14. He brought me out of the pit, the pit of destruction. When he brings us up, he brings us up in his purposes. He sets our feet on a rock, the rock of his faithfulness and the rock of his righteousness. And we will find ourselves in these pits 
so that we can see God in action. We need sometimes to experience God bringing us onto a firm place where he can establish our steps and he can teach us and guide us. I really think that this is probably one of the main reasons for our pit experiences. Because he wants to create something new within us. You may be going through pit experiences. You may be going through difficulties that only you hold in your heart. But he is the God who lifts us out of the pit. He is the God who lifts us into his purposes. How else can he perfect us so that he can present us to God? How else can he do that? Colossians 1 says that he wants to present us to the Father, holy and blameless and without reproach. And as Jude reminds us, as he works in our lives and as he takes us through each day, he reminds us now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless. That is amazing, isn't it? That God wants to present us to himself faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. We may find ourselves in the pits of heartache, of bereavement, of loss, of pain, of depression, and despair, But listen to those words of God's assurance over your life. Let me read those words again. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. He will keep you from stumbling. He will raise you up and he will present you faultless before the throne of God. And he doesn't just do it, he does it with a heart of joy. Because he loves you so very much. He gave himself for you. Totally and completely. In every way. So that one day, one day, he can present you to God. A job well done. Amen. So ask yourself the psalmist questions. Psalm 42. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why are you disturbed within me? And the answer is in the echo of David's response. Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. Our hope is in him. Our blessed hope is in him. He is the God of our salvation. He is our soon coming king. Jesus. The question I've got for you is, is is he your hope tonight? And do you know him? Is he your hope? Because this world offers us no hope. We've only got to look at the TV screens to see how much hope it offers us. But in Jesus, there is hope. There is a future. There is purpose for our lives. And if you're walking with with Christ, is it really bumpy at the moment? Are there plenty of stones in front of you? Have you fallen into the miry pit? Have you fallen into that place of despair? And are you sitting there wondering why? Well, I trust that God has spoken by his Holy Spirit 
tonight to explain to you why. Because he wants to draw you closer to him. He wants to minister into your circumstances. He wants to create in us a pure heart. He wants us to build a relationship. And he wants to present us perfect to the Father. There's so many questions, isn't there? And we could go on. Do you need a new song? Do you need to hear his voice? Then I'm going to invite you to come to him tonight. I'm going to invite you to come to him. Let's just uh, close our eyes. I'm not going to have an appeal. I'm not going to ask people to put their hands up or anything like that. But I am going to ask you to come before a sovereign God. And whatever your need is, whatever your situation is, if you need salvation, we will pray with you. If you need healing and you need to be lifted out of the pit, we'll pray with you. Because God knows. He knows the pain. He knows the despair. Because he's been there. And he'll walk through it with you. And he'll lift you up out of the miry clay, out of that pit of despair. And he will set you on a firm foundation. He's faithful and he's true. If you need something from God tonight, as we close our meeting tonight, please come and let us pray with you. If you want to ask Jesus into your heart, you need to do it now. Now is the day of salvation. You need to do it now. You need to come to him. You need to confess that you're a sinner, that you can't do this by yourself, and that you need his salvation. You need to repent and turn to him. And he will give you new life, a new purpose, a new start. But he will also heal and minister and bless. So, Heavenly Father, we just come to you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that it's so real, that you speak right deep into our hearts. Lord, I thank you for the way that this, these few verses have ministered to me through all the difficulties and trials that we've been through. Lord, we know that even if we're, we're still there, you are faithful, you are true. We're not going to give up on you. You're going to take us through this. And you're going to help us. So, Lord, we just commit ourselves to you now. We ask your blessing and your shalom to rest upon us as we go out and live our lives for you this week. But if you need prayer this, this evening, as we as we sing our last song, I'm going to hand it back to Steve now, and we'll pray with you and we'll minister to you. God is so got good things for you. He wants his face to shine upon you. He wants his blessing to be upon you. He wants his countenance to look over you. And he wants to give you his shalom, his peace, that passes all understanding. We thank you, Lord. Amen.